$50 a month. I repeat, $50 a month. You can broadcast live over the airwaves and have your opportunity to speak. And take it from me, it really couldn't be easier. You might ask, how can I do this? I'm no Casey Kasem, a radio station. Surely it's too expensive. I could never get on air. Well, nonsense. $50 a month. Total Truth Broadcasting Live Support will have you up and running in minutes. And with the click of a mouse, you're on the air when you want to be saying what you want to say. Oh, and did I mention this low monthly rate also includes a chat room? Yes, that's right. Your very own chat room. Another cool tool to share ideas and information. Do you belong to a community organization? Imagine your organization with its own radio station. Or perhaps share a station with another club. Broadcast news, sporting events, results, upcoming meetings or gatherings. And use your chat room to keep in touch. All for just $50 a month. It's a great way to communicate with your members. And truly very easy to do. Listen, folks, if this technology existed back then, the cavemen would have been doing it. So get on over to TotalTruthRadio.com where you'll find details on this wonderful opportunity to own your own radio station. TotalTruthRadio.com Drop out with me, John Zascota, on Stranger Advice every Friday from 1 to 3 p.m. Central Standard Time on Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. Together, we'll research the mysteries surrounding the past, the realities of the present, and how we can change our future. Right now is the most amazing time to be alive. Stranger Advice is about learning to live and living to learn more. Be sure to like us on Facebook, and you'll be entered to win a number of our giveaways. Let's go out of the realistic and into the mystic. So be sure to join us for Stranger Advice with John Zascoto. Fridays, noon Eastern, right here on freedomslips.com, Revolution Radio. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. our show Everything Psychic at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where we will be taking listener callers and doing live psychic readings on the air at Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. Please visit my website at www.thereadersgroup.com for more info, and we look forward to seeing you then. This is Thomas, a.k.a. a mad painter. I'd like you to join me Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Open Canvas. Don't forget to bring an open mind. Yes, folks, that's right. Bring an open mind to an open canvas. Again, that is Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern. You oppose government corruption. This is Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. Thanks for listening while we take that short break here at Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com. And now we're going to get back to your host. How are you is there, that, Michael? Is that the masses cheering there we heard on there? Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> so we're back. Uh, back to a separate reality with your hostess with the mostess. Hostess with the mostess. A hostess is a female. We'll keep it to the host with the most. Unless I am a transvestite, then I am the hostess with the mostest. Um, Michael Hemmingson, here with uh, Ronald Malfi. You're still with us, Ronald? I'm still here. You're still there? That's good. Okay, as I was saying, uh, Ron is a uh, 
professional writer of uh, of uh, various genre novels and and short stories. Uh, what, what, what what's your latest book? Uh, the uh, latest one was Floating Staircase that came out uh, uh, last October, and uh, I did a uh, about a three month book tour uh, to support that book, and it, the sales have been pretty good. Uh, reviews have been good. Um, it was it was nominated for a Bram Stoker Award for uh, best novel, uh, and I just just had come back from uh, Utah I get, for the Stoker Awards. I guess uh, was it two weeks ago now. Uh-huh. Um, so that was a good time, and uh, yeah, it's doing pretty well. I'm I'm really pleased to to see so many people really enjoying it. Did you win? Um, no. If I won, I wouldn't be on this show. I'd be on a different show, right? Oh, that's right. <laughs> you, you, you'd be on a yeah somewhere else. That's right. <laughs> we're, we're we're the 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 uh, non the contender non winner radio program. Yeah. Yep. Well, it's an honor to be nominated and to be on the show. <laughs> oh yeah. No, yeah, I, I didn't win. Uh, Joe McKinney won for his novel novel uh, Flesh Eaters. Uh, great guy and a good book. So, uh, yeah, it was just a lot of fun to get out of the house and actually do something. We have my wife and I have a. Uh, 19 month old daughter so it's like <laughs> I think the last time I, we got out of the house was last Stoker Awards <laughs> so yeah, it doesn't happen often well and and that's something that uh, Ron and I we, we share a lot of commonalities and one of them is we're both new fathers uh, Ron's got a, a 19 month old daughter and, and my daughter's just uh, two weeks ago turned one yeah. um, so we're both uh, uh, at least for me i am become a father a little later in life when a lot of my uh, friends are becoming grand grandparents. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, uh, you have a child at twenty, and you're probably be a grandparent by forty. Uh, so it's, you see that a lot. Wow. Yeah. Then, well, no. This <laughs> we waited enough time, and uh, I'm 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 going to be thirty five, but uh, she still seemed to sneak up on us. <laughs> so. Well, I remember talking to you. You said you wanted a big family. Yeah, I did, uh, and I, I still do. I love the idea of it. It's the practicality of it <laughs> that you know you're actually yeah. responsible for a human being 24 hours a day, and uh, it's a lot of work. But I, I love it. I, I love being a dad. It's it's great. And and your daughter Madison, right? Uh, yes. Is she she walking yet? Walk. Oh yeah, she's walking. Yeah. Talk, she's eight, yeah, 18 months old. Yeah, walking, well, what, talking, and eating well, how, food. How old was she when she started walking? Uh, I guess around maybe, and uh, it was somewhere between the nine and nine year, nine month mark and, and a year, somewhere in there. Uh, I'm just wondering because because my daughter, her name is Romina, she uh she's still trying to to get up to to walking on her own. Um, yeah, that seems to be, around the year mark seemed to be the what I've seen with my other friends' kids, and and maybe mine was like that too. I don't really remember the exact age she was. And now, does does yours? Does she have to 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 bite everything, every toy, every anything? She's just now getting over that. Yeah, that was a oh, big yeah. thing for a while. Like, she, I guess she's just finishing up teething, so uh, you know the biting has slowed down now that she's got all her teeth. But yeah, that was a big. Everything I've got it's got bite marks in it, drool on it. Okay. <laughs> well, 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 my daughter, she's uh, she's fascinated with my cell phone, even though we bought her. Yep. Um, uh, toy cell phones. She still wants. That's, I I I go to see her, and the first thing she looks for is my cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> and how how is that that they know the fake cell phones from the real ones? They don't want the fake ones. They want yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny with and and with no instigation, uh, she'll grab the cell phone and put it in her ear and go, bah, 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 you know, which I think she gets from her mother. Um, but but yeah, Ronnie, you know it's 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 interesting and and amazing to watch their personalities start start to come out. As, oh yeah, they, they're little people, man. They're little people. They're, yeah. they're little people and brats. <laughs> and <are> brats yes. <laughs> My, mine, she has to throw everything down the ground when she's bored with it, and she'll hold it out like, "Oh, this is nothing," and then toss it. And then when she tosses it on the ground, she wants it back. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so much for for fatherhood. Let's get back to to writing and publishing. So, so Ron, a lot of your your books are classified genre. But you, I know that you you don't like to be labeled as a genre or writer, or is that still the case? Um, well, you know, I, not that I, I don't really have a preference on what what labels people want to use. I don't I don't really subscribe to that so much myself. But 
um, you know, I, I, I think it does a disservice to people who try to read my stuff and they're expecting one type of, of genre, one, you know, a specific type of style and, and book. And, you know, I, I, I don't feel that my stuff necessarily fits all into one easy little niche like that. So to be fair to readers looking for my stuff or, or perhaps, uh, you know, if you're, if you're listening to this and you haven't read any of my books, you know, I, I, I do think that they're all fairly different and, you know, to, to say they're all horror novels would probably be, would, would be doing the, uh, the, you know, the books themselves a disservice. Not that I, I mean, I love horror and I, that's, you know, that's the, the genre I most relate to, but, you know, I, I've written, uh, thrillers, I've written some mainstream stuff, um, you know, so yeah, I think that it's pretty much across the board. And uh, I forgot the title of your boxing novel. Oh yeah, yeah, that's uh, the nature of monsters. No, was that you would have considered that literary or? or... Yeah, that was my um, my third uh, published book, and it was sort of I, I had just written the Fall of Never, uh, and it, it had gotten some pretty good uh, reception from the horror community. It was a more of a modern gothic. Uh, story, and you know, while I was thrilled with that and, and how how well it was accepted, you know, I was always as a writer pushing myself to do something different. So the next book I wrote was the the Nature of Monsters, and mm-hmm. uh, it was just a story of uh, what I wanted to do is sort of modernize uh, all the uh, the writings uh, from like the you know the old Lost Generation, the the twenties, uh, you know, Ernest Hemingway, uh, Fitzgerald. Uh, this was sort of my take on uh, the Great Gatsby and the Sun Also Rises, where I've had modern characters sort of behaving in that uh, sort of flapperish, uh, you know, era. And yeah, I had fun with the book. I really liked it. It's actually one of my personal favorites. But it's uh, it's it's out of print now, and very few people read it when it when it came out. So I think that uh, solidified my interest more in genre fiction at the time, based on the well, sales yeah. numbers. Well, didn't didn't the the publisher disappear not too long after they put it up? Yeah, you know, it was a uh, I was approached by a publisher that, and they wanted to put out a, a a novel, and I sent them the manuscript to that. They really liked it. I think they had been anticipating something more in the horror arena as well. So they liked the book and wanted to publish it, but I guess our contacts or, or their contacts and and their marketing uh, folks just didn't really know what to do with it. So it it they published it. It, it Sold a few copies. Um, I did a couple of speaking engagements at a college to support it, and then the publisher dried up, and I had I since had the book go out of print. Um, and I still like it, but I've I've just I've got no uh, interest in bringing it back into print. It's just uh, it, it, you know it it doesn't really fit in with a lot of the stuff I'm currently doing now, and it reads to me at least it reads like an, an older book of mine. Well, that's that's always the. Uh, the 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 downside of working with small publishers is that they come and go like like I don't know I don't have a, a <laughs> like similar for like, the, like small publishers yeah, <laughs> yeah they come and go like small publishers <laughs> uh, um, but but you 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 then signed with uh, uh, a fairly large uh, mass market paperback publisher um, Dorchester Leisure Books um, but th- they only put out one book right the snow yeah, they did. Uh, yeah, but well, in the meantime, from when I left, before I signed with uh, Dorchester, I had uh, done two books with Medallion Press, and they had uh, um, they were more they were my first kind of taste into the uh, mass market arena, and uh, so I was writing for them, and then I and I had always wanted to. I mean, if you're going to write horror fiction, you know, going back just as as recently as like two years ago. You know, Dorchester was the place to be. So I had I liked a lot of their authors. I became friendly with the editor, uh, and um, you know, I, I had tried to I, I had submitted some stuff to to Dorchester a few times in the past, and you know, just got the rejections. And uh, you know, and I'm a fairly a fairly quick writer, so I would send maybe two manuscripts submissions a year to the editor over there, Don Daria. And uh, after a while, I stopped doing it. And, and I got an email from Don one day saying, uh, "Hey, what? No, no manuscript this year." <laughs> so, yeah. So I kept getting rejected, and I realized, you know, I realized the stuff I was sending them wasn't really the stuff that they were publishing. So I was trying to really squeeze this the square peg into a round hole. And um, so when when it came time, you know, I, I gave myself one last shot with them, and I said, you know, I said to my wife, "I'm like, you know what? I'm going to just go and I'm going to write the story that I know that they want me to write." 
and uh, that's where Snow came from. I wound up uh, just writing the first two or three chapters and a really vague outline and sent it to them, and I really didn't think uh, they'd be interested. And then they came back and said, oh, this, this sounds great, I'd like to see the full manuscript, and I had to lock myself in my basement for two weeks and finish the book that I lied about and said was already done. So, yeah, so that's how that came about. So that was, that was Snow. That was my, my one and only uh, Dorchester Leisure Books title. Yeah, because uh, uh, Dorchester, which, which uh, had the corner market uh, and mass market paperbacks for horror and uh, even romance, uh, they just suddenly, what was it, two years ago, went bankrupt. They went belly up and uh, weren't paying their distributors and writers and uh, apparently now they only do ebooks. Is that right? Um, I, to be honest with you, I don't know what they're doing right now. Uh, well, they, yeah, they, they, they they've got they got themselves in some financial issues. They, you know, I'm sure you could, you know, your your listeners can hop online and find any message board out there that's complaining about how they've handled themselves lately. And you know, uh, for me, I, I dealt directly with my editor over there, and he remains a fantastic guy, and he's no longer with them. Um, so anything that went behind on uh, behind the scenes there, I, I'm sort of removed from it. But you know, I mean, I, I'm not happy with how things played out, as as I'm sure a lot of their authors and and all the other people they owe money to are either. Uh, but, excuse me a sec. Could you yeah. uh, yell out your website so the listeners can find you? Ah, uh, sure thing. It's it's ronmalfi.com, and uh, I'm very poor at updating it. So you could also track me down on Facebook under Ronald Malfi. And uh, if you find me on there, uh, send me a friend request, and I'll I'll hit that button. And and if you want to start with Ron's work, I mean, he's got a couple stories online for free. But I, I would suggest uh, Snow, which is a, a great read if you're into uh, zombies. And and right, zombies. And um, oh, now you're insulting me. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, at least they're not uh, raccoon zombies. And um, that's a, a, a in joke between us. Um, uh, one of one of my favorite books of Ron's is, is Passenger, um, which was published by Delirium, right? It's it's, it's is it still yeah. available? Uh, yeah, it's still it's still uh, available in uh, the hard covers were were sold out and they're out of print, but uh, the uh, paperback and ebook are, are still available. And yeah, that was published through. Uh, it was my first uh, book with Delirium. And yeah, uh, I, I, yeah. I've okay. I've known Delirium since they started. The guy Stanley used to publish stories of mine, and he had a magazine called. Uh, oh, okay, uh, it was called Delirium, I think. And we were going to do a collection back in. Uh, I think it was 2002, mm -hmm. uh, uh, limited edition, and he printed, I don't know, four or five hundred, and they all got destroyed in a flood in his basement. Oh, jeez. So, <laughs> every, every time I tried to do a project with Stanley, something comes up. He's, he's, he's paid me for the stuff, but every time we were going to do a novella, um, the, uh, a novella chapbook version of that, of my story, a, a, a hard boiled zombie yeah. detective, which, which wound up in that anthology we're in. Um, yeah, and I can't remember what happened. Like, uh, oh, he got he got hired to design uh, limited edition chapbooks, but but the, the person who hired him didn't want competition, so killed off his, his line. Uh, he still paid me for it though. He paid me something like three hundred bucks, and <laughs> said sorry. Yeah, uh, Shane is an anomaly in publishing. He's actually a publisher who pays you. Efficiently on time, uh, you know, the, the checks show up when I, before you even start missing them. So yeah, that's, oh, which is great, know. which is uncommon. fantastic. Well, well, that that brings up something you know with Chains Delirium Press and a, and a number of presses that that you work with is, is in the horror genre is that they uh, uh, there's this market for uh, limited print one you know fine editions, um, right? That you know are priced like what fifty sixty bucks or something like that. Yeah, forty bucks. Right. Um, th these are really nicely designed uh, books with, with with quality paper, smice stone, and and all that stuff, which you don't see too much of anymore. Um, but but that's you know uh, fairly lucrative or, or brings in a check, right? You oh know, yeah, you... yeah, it is, and it's also you know I when I started looking at that. You know, I thought, you know, who who spends this kind of money on a book? Because I'm I'm a, I'm a reader, and I and I tear through my books, and the idea of spending if I spent sixty dollars on every book I bought, I'd be living in a box made of books, I guess. But uh, 
you know, so when I first started looking into it and I, and I started working with Shane, I, I realized that there were, I mean, there are people out there who are just fanatical about the books that they collect and they're, they're, uh, they're collectors and, and they're, they know what they want. They know what the, they want the books to look like. And they're really, uh, I'm really, uh, just impressed by their, their devotion to collecting these books and, and how they look and, and not just specific authors, but even, uh, they'll collect, you know, everything a specific publisher puts out. Um, so what I try, you know, I, I've got a, I've been working with Shane for a while now. We've done a couple of books and a, and a series of novellas and, um, you know, with all the novels that I do, uh, with Shane, they are, um, those hard covers are limited to, I think they, they change anywhere from 150 to 100 copies depending on the book. And, um, they usually sell out in pre-order and they do run for about 50 or $60. But I do also make sure, uh, that I, that, for readers, casual readers of my work, that a paperback edition and or ebook will also be available. So you know, for nine bucks, ten bucks for a paperback. So yeah, it, I pretty much try to cover all the bases for all different types of readers. Well, like like uh, uh, comic book and graphic novel collectors, um, a lot I know a lot of pe- these people collect these uh, limited editions as as uh, possible investment. Right. Um, because if 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 you if you grab a say for instance you know you, you hit the, the the bestseller list with Stephen King eventually which I'm sure you will those those yeah. books are gonna go up uh, in value tenfold sure especially especially if they're signed usually they're all signed right they send you plates to, to sign yeah they send us the um, uh, signature sheets to to sign and then we send them back and um, they're incorporated into the book that way. But yeah, and I've noticed that even with Delirium, you know, if you look up and you know find some of their really early titles that are out of print in in really any format now, uh, like on eBay or or try to find them through a seller on Amazon, they're pretty expensive, you know. So they do uh, go up in value, um, you know, if you hold on to them. Yeah, I know. If if you had any of those uh, Stephen King or Joe Lansdale uh, early limited editions, I mean, yeah, they they go for several grand. Among oh, the yeah. collectors, um, and 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 I should note that these these small specialty publishers, you know, they're generally one one man, two man operations out of, out of people's homes, um, and these people do make a a, a decent uh, amount of money running these businesses, um, uh, and some of them go big, like uh, Subterranean Press, right? Uh, was started out the guy just started out doing stuff out of his home. Was a friend of Joe Lansdale, and, and Joe helped him out. Now, now the Subterranean is uh, almost as big as a, a New York house. I mean, they they put out uh, the Robert first, McCannon's lab, newest Mc, book, right? McKinnon and yeah. and then George R. R. Martin's uh, The Game of Thrones. Uh, they, they they put out special editions with illustrations, and and, they, and these things go for like 150, 200 bucks out the door. Yeah, no, um, yeah that's cool. Um, uh, and then. Uh, that guy, uh, uh, Donald Grant, in the '80s was was putting out Stephen King stuff. I think oh, yeah. he still does. Before, so how does that work when? Because you had that done with Snow, right? Yeah. How does that work in the contract with with Dorchester? That he, he... Uh, usually, uh, a mass market publisher really isn't affected by the sales of a limited edition hardcover book, so it, they're. Uh, more than willing to let you retain those rights and sell them elsewhere. So that's what I did with Snow. The, you know, Snow was, when I signed the contract with uh, Dorchester, there was a caveat in there that I would turn around and sell the hardcover book without their involvement. They 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 let me retain those rights. So I I wound up. Uh, so the paperback came out first, and then I wound up going through uh, Shane uh, over at uh, Delirium, and he had this imprint called Alter Thirteen that releases um, limited. Uh, very limited editions of previously published uh, books that had just been out in paperback. So he released, uh, I think it was um, like 13, well, I guess that's where the 13 comes from, 13 uh, leather-bound slipcase editions of the book, and then uh, the remainder were all the um, you know, hardcover, dust-jacketed, uh, signed, uh, limited editions. Do, did, does he give you a copy or two of the, the leather-bound? Yeah, he gives me a copy of every edition he publishes. So yeah, and they're really cool looking. I gotta say. Oh yeah, I I, yeah. I haven't 
I haven't done that yet. I, I, I really wish I had one of my books leather bound and <laughs> I, I have a couple of hardbacks from, from New York publishers. Um, but most of my books are trade paperbacks, uh, right? Mass market paperbacks. Um, but, uh, and now ebooks. Let's talk about ebooks. Um, talk. both you, you and I are, are prefer print books and stuff like that, but we have to admit that the ebook revolution, uh, Brings uh, money into our homes. Yes, it does. And, and the publishers, or if you do it yourself, you usually see the, the money pretty quickly, you know, within the month um, or, or whatever. And instead of waiting, you know, every six months for, for, for a traditional publisher, um, what, what, what do you think about the ebook market, the, the way it's going right now? Well, you know, I try to leave my, my, my personal preference when I sit down and read a book is, is to hold one in my hand. I've got nothing against uh, e-readers, people who read e-books, and just like you said, I mean, they're they're selling, and, and authors and publishers are making money, and, and that's always a good thing. Um, yeah, I, I, I my preference is to, and I've got I've got e-books available of pretty much all of my titles. Um, my preference would is always to also have a uh, hardcover or paperback edition also for people who just prefer to read them that way. So I try to work that in with uh, with my contracts. And for the most part, you know, everybody's been, uh, all the publishers are in agreement with that. And I think the industry in, in, in a whole is just kind of feeling out this whole trend right now. Um, I, I don't know what, you, what you've seen personally, uh, Mike, on, on your end, but I, I'd say maybe this past year, my my ebook sales have finally just kind of come up and, and, and met my my paperback sales and for the amount of uh, books sold and money coming in. So it's almost a 50-50 split as of this this past year, or, the, or at least this past few quarters uh, of royalty statements. Well, yeah, I mean, there's already, with the, the Justice Department just filed uh, an yeah, lawsuit that, yeah. uh, about uh, Penguin and a couple others. Uh, yeah. Price, uh, not, yeah. Price market or, or uh, price, I don't know what they're doing. It's an antitrust thing on, on ebook. Uh, pricing. Right. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. They're the price gouging thing. Yeah, they're they're basically it's it's illegal to, to you know you could you could be a, you could have a product and sell it for whatever you want to sell it for whatever the market will bear, but it's illegal to then get together with your cohorts in that industry and decide what you're going to price it and and basically uh, kick out all other competition. That's and that's what I think uh, DOJ was looking at with some of those publishers, and I think. Like three out of the five settled. Uh, you know, I, I just I had just skimmed uh, some of the article and I knew a little bit of, of what happened with that. But um, yeah, I mean, hey, that's gonna. That, that, I don't think that's uh, you know specific to publishing. That's gonna happen in any industry. But you know, it's it's a perfect example of of this new technology that's out there that the industry is is trying to catch up with and and figure how how they're gonna use it. And similarly, you know. The, the the law is is trying to figure out how to govern sales of that stuff and make sure everything's on the up and up and people aren't getting ripped off and there, there's not monopolies working behind the scene and you know it, it really opens up a whole can of worms with with, with all this de, you know technology but other than that I think it's a good thing as long as people are reading and and enjoying what they're reading that's hey you could read it on the back of a cereal box for all I care <laughs> well the uh, I mean there are people publishing themselves through uh, Amazon Kindle and stuff who are uh, uh, selling, I mean, there are rare cases, but selling upwards to a million copies of, of their ebook. And now, yeah. now we see Am Amazon taking their, their uh, uh, more lucrative self-publishers and then uh, uh, doing print-on-demand editions through, through an Amazon publishing imprint. Right. Um. Yeah, I mean, look, the technology is there for for anyone to do this. Uh, do I think that's necessarily a good thing? Uh, you know, I guess it depends how you look at it. I, I think if you know, if an industry is inundated with you know uh, folks who who consider themselves writers and but can't write but think they can because they can just publish anything. I think that uh, denigrates the entire industry to a, a point. I mean, and especially if you're trying to market ebooks primarily, and, and you're trying to convince people to transition over to ebooks. You know, do, are the first ten ebooks that you want these people to download going to be 
you know, self-published garbage that's poorly edited, you know, poorly formatted, and just a bad story. And I'm not saying all self-published is that way, but it certainly opens the door for, for people uh, to, to publish that sort of thing. Um, you know, I, having worked with some really good editors in the past and, and, and currently, uh, they are invaluable. And I, I could not imagine publishing anything without some with one of these these uh, talented folks actually looking at it and making sure I didn't sound like an idiot before it gets uh, <laughs> sent to the press. Well, yeah, you always need that that other eye to sure to, to, to hire. The, the one thing that, that that has always amazed me is is uh, you know no matter how many times uh, several people go over the galleys and I go over my galleys, there always seems to be some weird little typo <laughs> that makes oh, yeah. it through. <laughs> and you'll you'll always get that one reader who finds it and, and feels it necessary to email you about it. <laughs> exactly. And just so you know, on page five hundred and nineteen, there's an extra zero on the page cut. Yeah, I know. Uh. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Oh, no, yeah, <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> it's true. It's like, well, what you think I'm like writing these things in crayon in my basement? I, I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, you know, it's it's just you know, quite interesting how our our eyes we, we don't see a certain typo or not. And we we think it's a, a correct, and then later on looking at it, we're like, how did I miss that? You know, well, you, you're reading you're reading it, and you're you're yeah, you know, your brain fills in what the rest of the sentence is supposed to be. But, you know, I've heard somewhere that they they say you should, if you're editing for misspellings and and not for content, but just you know typos and stuff, is to actually read it backwards. So you're reading and looking at every individual word. I don't, oh, I've never okay. I've never done it, and I don't know if I'd have the uh, wherewithal to actually sit and read an entire manuscript backwards. But you know, good for those who do. <laughs> Well, as long as they they don't, uh, uh, as long as your your name isn't misspelled on the on the book cover, <laughs> that that's happened to some people. I mean, my friend William Volman, uh, one of his books, his, his his last name is Volman with two N's, but uh, one time the, uh, a book came out in England with one N, and <laughs> and another time a book of his with Grove Press, he he didn't he didn't even bother to look at um, the final uh, uh, the uh, the the uh, advanced reader proofs that yeah. went out, he didn't bother to look at it, and, and and just almost at the last moment, someone told him, "Hey, there's an entire fifty-page section in the wrong place in the book." <laughs> yeah, yeah, I will say I'm I'm pretty meticulous about it. I I go through when I get the galleys in, I go through them, and I usually can't sleep until I get them done. So I'll probably go through the edits on a on a new on a, like on galleys within the first day I get them, um, while the story's fresh. Because if I if I sit if I let too much time go between the editing of it, I forget. Like, I want to make sure all the time, the time frames in line, that I got the dates right, that I didn't say she's got brown eyes here and blue eyes here, and you know. Right. So I sit down and I'll read through the whole thing when I get it in. If if your character Mary becomes Maria in the uh, yeah <laughs> on page one hundred, um, um, well, another thing too is 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 what happened to me uh, two thousand three or four with with one of my publishers, Blue Moon Books, is that they printed a book. By an author named Michael, uh, what was it? Michael Parker, I think, uh -huh. uh, a novel called Burn, um, but with my name on it, Michael Hemmingson. And they <laughs> they printed ten thousand copies. You know, I, I've got one copy of it, but they had the pulp, you know, the whole print run and and redo it. Oh, jeez. <laughs> well, it's not so bad if you get the royalties from it too, I guess. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I guess, you know, or maybe, maybe it, it brings extra readers to buy the other books. Um, but, but that was caught before, uh, most of the copies went out through Publishers Group West, so. Right. Um, but that happens, you know, the publishing, uh, uh, much like Hollywood, uh, I think a lot of people think publishing is this big professional, uh, a bunch of professionals who have it together and, are slick there in New York, but if you go into the offices of most of these major publishers, it's it's chaos. <laughs> yep, you, you got oh, yeah. people running around, manuscripts everywhere. Uh, usually, when the the seasonal catalogs are coming out, people are you know working late into the night, morning, you know, getting all this stuff ready, and and mistakes happen. Oh yeah, no, it's huh? I mean it's human error, man. It's somebody reading a book and looking for for mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, let's let's talk about uh, your forays into the into film. Um, okay, you uh, you um, 
you sold a, a treatment to Paramount a couple of years ago, a few years ago, Triggerfish, uh, uh, just based on an outline. Can you, can you talk about that? I'm sure people will find that interesting. Yeah, you know, and and it's not really a standalone story. To give you some some backstory to that, that came about when uh, my father, who is a uh, retired Secret Service agent, uh, he had uh, worked a case back in the, the late 70s on, on this gang called the Westies in Manhattan. And he was the undercover agent on that case. And he was doing some television stuff at the time. He had a TV series back in the, uh, man, was it 1991 or so? It started on NBC called Secret Service. He had been the, uh, he was a creative force behind getting that developed. So he had was, some was connections. That, wasn't Gerald Ford's son the host of this? Yes, he was. <laughs> it was originally, that, that series was originally pitched as, uh, you know, like an hour-long drama. The NBC wanted to switch it around and change it into this kind of narrated, reality-based, uh, you know, you, you've seen, it's almost like, like, um, like cops meets, like law and order sort of stuff, you know. So that's what they did, and uh, I think it ran for a season or two before it was canceled. But my dad made a lot of contacts there and really... Uh, uh, you know, was pushing uh, his material. So he had uh, Paramount was interested in in, in the story uh, with him from the case that he did with the Westies, and uh, they had optioned that and had had commissioned a screenplay to be written. And um, I had no involvement with any of that. Actually, I was pretty young at the time when that happened. But nothing ever came about that uh, until I think there was, you know, the option ran out as those as they normally do. And I think it was right around the time that it was going to get optioned again that my dad and I sat down and we decided to write that into a book. Um, and that became Shamrock Alley. Uh, it came out in 2009. And that, that book basically is a fictionalized, it's, it's, it's a novelized version of uh, the case that he worked. Um, so again, you know, the book came out, but the, uh, the option ran through. And uh, it's, it's since been optioned. I think it's been my most optioned book. Um, everybody's always interested, but nobody wants to put up money to, to make it. But, um, you know, and that, well, all that did is, is kind of open the door for, uh, you know, uh, some of these producers to ask what else was out there. So Trigger Fish was sort of written as a follow up to the, the Shamrock Alley option. Uh, quite frankly, the, 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 the story concept and, uh, the screenplay was really written by my dad. Uh, I, I, I was more, uh, I, I was the, uh, the book writer for Shamrock. He, he was really the, the guy doing Trigger Fish. So, uh, you know, any, uh, any accolades would have to go to my old man on that one. Or, or lack of accolades, if you consider that was never made either. So I'll, I'll pass both along to him. But yeah, so that's how that got started. You know, I, I know, Mike, you've been doing a lot of the stuff with Hollywood too. And, you know, these options, uh, are, you know, they, they come and go. And it's amazing that they'll, you know, people will be so interested in something. And even, you know, uh, you know write a check and pay money. To, to see if they can develop this project, and not just for the with the author, but in some cases, you know, with with uh, two different projects of mine, you know, directors were hired, screenwriters were hired, uh, you know, they were they, they they brought all these people on board for about eighteen months, and then when it came time to give it thumbs up or thumbs down, they walked away from it after expending all this money. It's it's really amazing that the the dollars that Hollywood has to throw around on this stuff and, and never recoup it. Well, didn't they invest? Paramount invest about two million into Triggerfish. Oh, I don't know. I don't, like think, that? I don't that think, that think it was. I don't think it was that much. Uh, I, I, I used to know the breakdown for everything. I know, like the like the, the screenwriters, and actually, I don't know if I'm getting it confused with 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 Shamrock Alley or Triggerfish, but the screenwriters that they hired, like they got a hundred and fifty thousand, uh, which was more than my option for. Yeah, it probably was Shamrock because it was more than the option then for Shamrock was. You know, it's it's funny because they don't. You know, you wrote the book, but they don't want to hire you to write the screenplay. Yet, the, when the screenwriters write it, they want to know why the screenplay is not the same story as the book. And well, was it, was it wasn't in the case that that the 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 deal with the agent was that they wanted a certain yeah. director, but but they would only get the director if they hired their writers or something like that. Yeah, well, that that was sort of what I gleaned from some of the conversations. You know, nobody wants to come right out and say that, you know, to you. But you know the. You've got an agent representing a director, and the studio wants to work with that director, so they'll bring him on for this project if that agent can also bring on his screenwriters that he's trying to push. So they give you know the screenwriting gig to some guys who maybe don't even have you know any credits to their name just because they want to get this director on board. It's you know it it's 
well, Frank, I think any movies ever get made ever. <laughs> but, you know, there's stuff out there. Uh, yeah. Uh, what, what a lot of people might not uh, realize is that with, with big blockbuster productions, uh, Hannibal being one of them, what, what the right. studio will do is actually hire about ten writers to write their own versions of the screenplay. Um, and then pay each of these writers you know, a hundred thousand bucks. Right. I mean, that's right there. That you know, they set aside a million dollars to to, and then they they choose which one is is the they feel the better screenplay, or they might mix some in together. That's why you'll see these movies have uh, three writers on it, along with a rewriter. Um, uh, oh yeah. You know, I, I know that David, you know, David Mamet's version of Hannibal was was chosen, but he was one of uh, ten writers. And, and that's 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 the way of, of some people to to actually make money. A lot of people probably don't realize that there's. I know personally uh, a, a number of writers in 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 Los Angeles who make six figures a year and don't have a damn production right. to their name. Right, and never had anything produced exactly. Yeah, or or the idea guys. I mean, some of these guys are idea guys. They go and pitch ideas to studios. Uh, these guys are great idea guys, but they don't know how to put the thing together, and all they do is sell ideas. Uh, yeah, it, it, and they're living in Bel Air, and their kids are yeah. going to the uh, private school. And no, I know it, it, it's yeah, it's amazing. People, are, I think the rule of thumb for screenwriting is if you if you see a if you see a movie uh, with screenwriter credits on there, like with more than like three guys in the name of the screenwriters, you know, like something got screwed up somewhere. And now they're just cutting and pasting from all the you know the versions that you're talking about. Well, usually, uh, mo- mo- I mean. Uh, like like the case of uh, this movie coming out, the Avengers, yeah. With with uh, uh, Josh or uh, there was uh, an original screenplay that they've had for the last two years. But when Josh Whedon got it, you know, he wanted to write his own version of it, right? Um, and 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 that's one of the reasons why the uh, the remake of Superman took so long because there were so many. I mean, Kevin Smith has a big story about when he got hired to write the screenplay, and right, and they kept flying him back and forth. And I, I think he said they spent somewhere like uh, ten million dollars in pre-production stuff before even getting started. Oh yeah, you know, and a lot of this stuff is even uh, it's it's all contractual based, or, or in, in some cases even guild driven, where where they're. Uh, you know, they got two screenwriters to write a, uh, an adaptation of a book that I write, but they don't want to sit down with me as the author to, to give them insight into how to write the script because the guild won't permit it. They don't want to share a writing credit. They don't. You know, it's it's a lot of this strange little, uh, not only not even infighting, but just this strange little distrust of everyone you work with out there. It's it's. Uh, I like living on the East Coast. I'm glad I don't have to deal with that stuff every day. <laughs> well, I remember you talking about you saw the screenplay they came up with for Triggerfish, right? And you yeah, said yeah it, I saw it. it was just all a bunch of one-liners or something like that. You, you know what? I've seen just like you're saying. I've seen so many different versions of these things that you know I forget which one was which, but yeah, you know, there it, it's amazing that they would even option a book to write something based off of it when, when it when the end result is so completely different than the book they've optioned you know why don't you just make up your own story and, and save yourself some money well they want to option a, a especially with a bestseller because they, they you know they bring in the, the fans of the books to, right sure to, to drive the the um the movie um 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 so shamrock alley so so shamrock alley was based on one of your father's cases he, he was uh Undercover with the, the the Irish mob is that correct? Yeah, uh, they, they were. I mean, even to call them a mob would have been too uh, complimentary. They were just a bunch of Irish thugs. They called themselves the Westies. They were. My dad got involved um, because they were passing counterfeit money, and that's that was the Secret Service's nexus to investigate. So my dad went undercover, joined their gang, was with them for several months uh, until he was uh, tailed by NYPD, who grabbed him. And they thought he was one of their their gang members. Turns, you know, they found out he was Secret Service. They said, "Hey, you know, we're we're looking at these guys uh, for about half of the unsolved homicides throughout Manhattan. They were they were chopping people up in their bathtubs and using their severed hands to leave fingerprints at crime scenes to distract police. And mm-hmm. so they, they told my dad, they said, "Hey, you know, you go after your counterfeit stuff, but uh, you know, 
get, you know, if you can buy guns, buy guns. If you can find anything about murders, you know, find that out. So he was really, uh, it got really in depth. And that's my kid crying in the background. Oh. No. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, they were, uh, he was in, he was undercover for a while. They, they never thought, they never figured out that he was a cop, but they, fi- they thought he might have been a snitch. And, uh, you know, they had wiretaps, uh, at their places where they were talking about killing my dad at their next deal where he was buying this stuff from him. And it got pretty intense. Yeah. Now, was your dad passing himself off as an Irish guy or, or just? No, a... no, no. He was the area. He was, uh, his backstory was he was just an Italian guy originally from Brooklyn, uh, who was doing some work in Manhattan, meeting some of the, these guys and, the one of the members of the Westies was interested in him because they were trying to get in. He was trying to get the Westies in with the Italian mafia. He thought they were a little more advanced and, and that would have helped their business out. So, you know, he saw my dad as maybe a nexus into them, uh, you know. But no, he was, uh, I mean, if you saw my dad, there's no way you're thinking. He looks like uh, Sylvester Stallone. He doesn't look like him, Sean Penn. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, so what's uh, what what new stuff is coming out? What are you working on? Um, well, the the new book uh, that's coming out in September is called The Narrows, um, and uh, it'll be out. Uh, it's, it, the the Flarium already put out the uh, uh, hardcover, and that uh, you know that that sold out. And uh, I think it was only a hundred copies of that printed uh, last month. Um, but the paperback and ebook come out in September through Sam Hain Publishing, um, and uh, it's sort of my uh, my spin on uh, I, I call it my, my vampire story that has no vampires in it. Uh, you know, it's about a, a town that's that's uh, on the verge of uh, economic uh, collapse um, in in western rural Western Maryland, and uh, they're uh, you know one after one big flood they're they're visited by this uh, this creature that uh, kind of feeds off of. Uh, towns that are that are dying i mean i i like the concept of you know if you're if you're this this thing that needs to go and feed off of people where would you go that you would be you know that wouldn't uh you know you wouldn't get caught doing it i guess where, where would it be easiest to do that and i'm like you know you'd, you'd probably find these little mill towns or mining towns or, or whatever they are throughout the u.s that are really just practically on the verge of being ghost towns anyway and that was sort of the uh, the impetus for this book. I just wanted to really show a small town that was slowly dying, both you know figuratively, but also literally. Um, oh, so so you're with Don back with Don Arya at Samhain. Yeah, you know uh, when he went over to Samhain, he had asked me if I had any material to send him. He wound up pub- uh, republishing a novella of mine that was previously published uh, in a collection called Borealis, and that came out uh, I guess like last last fall. Um, and that was uh, strictly ebook only. They only do uh, ebook only for their novellas. Um, the novels are, are paperback and ebook. Um, but he, he wanted a new a new novel, and I you know I'm friends with the guy. I like him, and I really wanted to see the the horror line succeed there. Um, so I wound up writing this book uh, pretty much for Don. You know, I, I thought he'd really like it, and uh, that's uh, that's that's going to be released in September. That'll be my first original novel with him. Uh, since he went over to Sam Hain. So I'm really excited about it. I hope it really does well for him over there. And, and his wife went over there, too, being a romance editor, right? No, she's not, actually. She went to okay. uh, Leah's over at Sourcebooks. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but, you know what the, the cool thing about Sam Hain, I'll say this because we were, you were talking about earlier about uh, royalties and, and, and waiting five, six months you know, for a royalty statement to come in. One thing I'll say about Sam Hain has been fantastic is they they pay you every month. They've been sending me every month. I get a royalty check. It's it's really cool, you know. And it's this this whole uh, you know ebook phenomenon has really allowed them for, to to facilitate stuff like that. So it's it's really cool. Well, it's because they they don't need to go through waiting for distributors to pay them and yeah, uh, you know the, the the money's going direct to them. So then they could uh, uh, directly pay you, which. Right. which which is which is nice, uh, uh, um, and and these publishers like uh, Sam Hain and Laura's Cave and Siren and Source, um, they've all been pick, picking up uh, freelance editors who are losing their jobs in, in you know Simon and Schuster and Random House. Yeah, uh, uh, you know I, I remember 
when Alora's Cave was kind of small, and I was like, ah. Eh. But now they're, uh, I, I know an editor at Simon & Schuster, she lost her job and went to Alora's Cave, and she's been asking me to, to come on. But, you know, I thought, you know, I really don't rate that stuff. Um, yeah, I know. Well, that's, yeah, the, 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 the sort of a genre, they want the happy ending, or, or they, they want this and they want that. Um, uh, but I'm tempted when, when I'm broke. Yeah, I think we saw, I think Alora's Cave had just kind of come on the scene when, when we were at that, you and I were at that, uh, that conference in Seattle that you had mentioned earlier. And I remember hearing yeah, about them yeah. and seeing, and the, the cool thing, I think some of their, their authors that they wound up signing, they signed after that, on that, during that weekend, because we had met them and they had been unpublished. And I think a few of them went on to become, uh, uh, best-selling authors too, you know? Yeah. That's yeah. fantastic. Like, uh, Anya Bast, I think, uh, Megan. Oh Hart. yeah, I remember her. Right. Yeah. Just, you know, and they've had fantastic careers. So, you know, I mean, you know, nowadays it's not, you, you can't sell any of this stuff short. It's just amazing what some of these independent presses are, are doing. And, you know, as far as, I mean, just look at what happened with Dorchester. Some of these smaller presses were just better equipped to deal with the changing uh, technology and the culture of publishing where it was headed than some of these stodgier old, you know, uh, publishing houses. It's, it's really been something to see. Well, I mean, there, there's there's a market. I mean, I mean, Alora's Cave. I I didn't know this. They they uh, they uh, trademarked the term Romantica uh, because I, I, I yeah I wanted to to do something with Olympia Press on uh, an anthology of Romantica short stories, and he said, "No, we can't do that because Alora's Cave owns that that <laughs> that category." And yeah. for those who don't know, Romantica is is just a term for romance that's uh, a little more X-rated, which uh, <laughs> romance books have always been X-rated. I mean, uh, romance books were just a, a term for softcore porn for women, <laughs> <laughs> basically. Uh, women ravished by Fabio. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, uh, good for them. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no. I, I can't, you know. I, I just don't write that stuff. Um, but Could you yell out your site again, please? Uh, my web, yeah, my website again is uh, ronmalfi dot com, uh, and, and you know my email is ronmalfi at yahoo dot com for anybody who wants to email me and tell me to stop writing because my books are so bad. But uh, no, nah, go ahead, contact me, and uh, you know we'll talk writing. What about your Jiggle service? You have a website for that? Yes, that's uh, Ron uh, Malfi. <laughs> I think it make you happy. Hemmingson dot com. I can't forget what I put it under. <laughs> oh no, no, I'm not pimping you out anymore. Okay. I, I, got out, I got out of that business. <laughs> um, let's see how much time we got left. So, uh, uh, you have about two minutes. Two minutes. Well, Ron, uh, thank you for being my first guest on my inaugural show. I, I'm, I'm, I'm honored and and well, pleased and 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 tickled pink and and giddy. Well, I, I'm flattered you'd ask me to do it, buddy. I, I appreciate it. Let's see. So, uh, a separate reality. Uh, I'll be here every Saturday from six to eight uh, Eastern Standard Time, uh, and we'll have uh, all kinds of different guests, from uh, writers to MK Ultra super soldiers and alien abductees and and whatever I find. I, I believe uh, 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 Matt Painter, we're having a, a fundraiser next Saturday, right? Uh, yes, sir. From three till uh, hosts go on live, and then it'll end at midnight. And and uh, well, why don't you pitch that? What what does that entail? Uh, we're just going to sell stuff that uh, uh, might be useful to people. I'm going to sell a couple of paintings. I'm not sure what other people are going to do yet, and maybe some uh, web graphics for somebody. We're just going to try and uh, do what we done last uh, month. And raise money to keep the station on the air. And do, are we doing fundraisers monthly? I'm I'm not sure uh, what what we've got uh, going. This is just going to be the second one. Uh, Hawk said it's going to be donations, uh, host sponsorships, giveaways. We're going to just party it up for the month to see if we can get up enough money to keep the station going another month. <laughs> Uh, well, well, in that mind, remember, uh, Revolution Radio doesn't run pesky ads that interrupt. Uh, it's, it's all user generated, uh, uh, relying on, uh, donations to, from you people out there. If you want to, uh, 
uh, sponsor a particular show or host, you could do that, or or just a, a general donation. And I believe Hawk also, uh, you could buy banner ads, right? Uh, yes, you can. Oh, and that's the end of it. And that's the end I'll of it. Tell you what, you've done a great for your first show, and I really enjoyed being here. Uh, thank oh. you for letting me. And remember, Confucius say, "Man who enters airport at metal turnstile is going to Bangkok." With that. <laughs> Thank you for listening to A Separate Reality, and next up is the uh, the Psychic Show, right? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Well, if you want to talk to a psychic, call them in, and they'll tell you all about your future. freedomslips.com home of revolution radio i'm deacon john and i'll be your host for the libertarian hour every monday through friday from 4 to 5 p.m eastern standard time topics we'll focus on are the constitution its principles american history politics and current events from a libertarian perspective and how our government and politicians have perverted our constitutional form of government together we can talk about the tea party occupy wall Street, Anonymous, Civil Disobedience, Martial Law, the Financial and Debt Crisis, the Federal Reserve Bank, the Powers That Be, New World Order, Police State, Big Brother, World War III, and current events associated with these issues. So, see you all on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for The Deacon John Show. FreedomSlips.com Now come and get your riddle on. Tom Gilroy, We the People, Monday through Thursday, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern. Revolution Radio, you don't need to expect us. We're already here. Hello, folks. Don't forget to tune in to the Impact Zone. My name is Francis Walsh. I will be your host to the newest daily first thing you listen to after work talk show where personal opinions finally meet an opposing view. The Impact Zone breaks away from politically correct debating and turns the discussion into a face-to-face -face struggle to win the hearts and minds of the listeners. The Impact Zone airs every Monday through Friday on freedomslips.com from 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and will feature the hottest debates and debaters on talk radio. Revolution. Revolution. Radio. Welcome 
to Revolution Radio. Revolution Radio is not intimidated by those who get upset when we disagree with their view. 